this to the cloud. This is week 12 of our 678 already, uh, Emerging Learning Technologies. We'll have part one tonight with, with Bo and with Sam, uh, and part two tomorrow. I've actually just booked a second guest who Sam knows very well. That's Ramesh Sharma from India, who will be joining us in Indian time. Uh, it'll be 9 p.m. tomorrow, his time or so, I think. And it's going to be 11.30 a.m. our time. So 11.30 tomorrow morning or right before lunch, we'll have him jump uh, in and we'll have a little conversation with Sam. Um, he's been kind of the the one of the foremost people in the field of distance learning for uh, decades along with Sam. In fact, he's listed on these 100 people lists that came out recently. Uh, and so Sam is the former Pro Vice Chancellor of Flexible Learning and the Director of the Center for Flexible Learning at the University of the South Pacific, which is in Fiji. Currently Principal Associate of Technology Education and Design Associates in Melbourne, Australia. Um, it's based in, in Melbourne doing ed tech consultancy services. Sam spent most of his professional life in the higher ed sector in a variety of roles uh, to do with enhancing learning and teaching and open flexible distance and online learning, kind of similar to myself in some ways. We're twin sons of different mothers. Um, and he's been working in a number of different venues and traveling the world, consulting with folks, um, whether it's Sri Lanka or in Australia or Fiji or, or America or Canada or so. He's got his degrees in Canada. Oh, Canada. Um, he possesses undergraduate um, qualifications from the University of Waikato, one of my old stomping grounds in Hamilton, Australia. I'll see my friend Elaine Coe from originally from Hamilton. Um, he was now working at Massey University. She was at Waikato. I've had folks from Waikato write book chapters for me. They do great work there in Waikato. They had the Wicked Center at the time when I was there visiting. Um, Sam possesses his undergraduate um, degree, as I said, from Waikato, his graduate from Concordia University in Montreal. Former president of Open and Distance Learning Association of Australia. He's been the executive editor of a very famous journal online, an SSCI journal, one that all, everyone aspires to, and that is distance education. Uh, he's been doing that for decades, it says since 1997, which means more than a quarter century he's been at the helm of one of the foremost journals in the field of distance learning and has really provided us a roadmap for where we're going to go in the future. He's the one who's edited, actually didn't decide to get someone else to edit. He actually edited the issue that came out this year um, or last year that we're reading for this week's discussion forum. So we're going to talk a bit about the, the issue that exists out there. In May 2014, the Open U of Sri Lanka awarded him with an honorary degree. Uh, for his contributions, again, to open, flexible, and distance and e-learning. I'm probably embarrassing him a lot, but I'm just reading his bio. Uh, and in July 2020, the Advanced Higher Education uh, Institute in the UK admitted him as a principal fellow in the Higher Ed Academy for his commitment, contribution, and strategic leadership in the scholarship of learning and teaching globally. Not only that, I found some more things on Sam. In 1990, oh no, um, Recently, in the last couple of years, Sam has dabbled into helping us learn better. And he is the inventor of learning pillows at home and work. Always a big fan of innovation and in pillows. In the last two years, <laughs> he has started to see learning pillows pop into the marketplace. They include data capture technology that tracks your attention levels and even maps out your dream intensity at night. But learning pillows can, can also be used in the workplace and in the school positioned right behind the employee or the student on a chair, capturing the content and employee attention levels to new material. Some employees find that the use of learning pillows can radically improve their skill development and performance as a fluffy device helps cognitive rehearsal and recall for acquired content. Just $19.99 today, just make your order today and get your fluffy pillow. But no, he's gone beyond that. Sam has gone beyond that recently, and he's got the advanced Sam Sleeper app. You can get the advanced Sam Sleeper app. You take virtual classes, 
and you turn off your camera, you mute your mic, and if your name is mentioned, the Psalm Sleeper app sends a smiley face emoticon and a hand wave, and then it activates a I'm busy button image, and you can go about your sleep and don't have to worry about class, and you'll get all your points because the Psalm Sleeper app has provided the emoticon just in time, just to help you out. You've earned your participation points for class, and you'll not likely be called on again. Now, I don't know what he has next beyond the Psalm Sleeper app and the Learning Pillow, but maybe, it may be his consultancy has designed something new for all of us to use and enjoy. Uh, Sam, can we get that in Amazon or where we go to someplace in China for this or where is that app? I don't I, I think I think there's something wrong here. I don't know what you're talking about. Did, uh, Jill, did you find the app? Did you look this up, Jill? You can look this up now. I'm sure it exists out there. I, I, really, many, I will really I really want to try this uh, the, the learning pillow. <laughs> You want to try the learning <laughs> pillow? Yeah. So yeah, I figured as much. Anyone else want to try these? You know? Uh, yeah, you're really curious. Uh, so I just have to say one more thing. April Fools. <laughs> I have my little April Fool joke for today. Okay, okay, okay. So I knew that. I knew that. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> you have bloody tooth. <laughs> <laughs> so we had to have a little fun going here. On, what, what is this guy talking about? These guys confused with some other psalm or somebody, and I don't know. They, but hey, there's an idea there. I might pick that up. You know, I might pick that up. Just I might maybe pick that up a <laughs> We'll bring you back next year when you have that for us. Um, good on so you, man. Good on you. Very clever. Very clever. <laughs> So I'm going to share my screen real briefly and show you a couple of the articles that are in the special issue, if I can get this right here. So let's see if I can, can do this and find um, uh, where I have this laid out in. Uh, here we go. Da, da, da. Sometimes this works and sometimes this doesn't. So if you have taken a look at the different articles for this coming week, um, we've got... We've got Psalms introductory article. So he describes from open science to uh, from open access to open science, open education and transition. Uh, we've got the 50 years of open education policy in Australia by Terry Evans, who I know, and Victor Jakopic. We've got open education and closed loop systems, enabling closures and open loops by Michael Gallagher and James Lamb. Are they from Australia? Uh, yeah, no, 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 no. They're, they're from UK, Scotland. Scotland. And then we have Transcending Post-Truth, Open Educational Practices in the Information Age by Michael Glasman, Shantanu Talik, and Minju Kang. And we have Towards Self-Directed Learning, How Do Nepali Adolescents Learn with MOOCs? I have no clue who this is. Shishi Lee, <laughs> Mina Ju, Dil Noza, Kardarova, and Curtis J. Bonk. We presented on that last week, if you're here with us. And then my friend Hen Tang, uh, Tao Tang from the University of South Carolina. He got his degrees at Penn State with his two colleagues there. Understanding college students' achievement goals towards open educational resources from the perspective of expectancy balance theory. And then Francisco and Karina Basu, a friend of mine who has a chapter in one of my books on MOOCs and open ed. Karina's great. She's in the Open U in the UK now. She was in Tasmania when I worked with her. So they got equity, diversity, and inclusion in open ed, a systematic review of the research. That sounds kind of interesting. Well, maybe I, I'll be the one. Maybe someone should take a look at what they found, or maybe Sam can talk a bit about more about what they saw. I'm just scrolling through here. Yeah. Okay, of course she's got a model for, okay, yeah, okay. And then, okay, well, it's upside down, we can't read that, but okay, I recommend that article, even though I haven't read that one. Then we got Mex Mexico, the National Autonomous University of Mexico from open education to open learning. The experience is there with Larissa and Myrna. And three more articles, Benjamin Hurich and Pence Lucas, uh, are we closed? Are we closed? Are we? So I have the book, The World is Open. Other people says the world is closed. 
debating the openness paradox in science. And my friend Aras Baskert from Turkey, along with Hassan Akar and three others of their colleagues, and Sam is on this one too, openness in education as a living idea, a longitudinal investigation of its growth and development. Maybe Sam can expand on what this article is about. And finally, we move to article, the last article in the issue, the open master, not a golf open master, open masters, uh, but uh, a new model of transnational higher education with Simon, Mertula, and Jacob. I'm not sure where they're from either, but I'll stop sharing my screen there and just say that's to entice you a bit to read the articles for this coming week that went into the special issue in November 2023 of distance education. And um, now we'll go back to Sam and um, ask you a few questions about your career. We can talk to you about that special issue. We can talk to you about where this whole world is headed. But first of all, before we go to the special issue, can you tell us how one becomes so well known in the areas of open, online, flexible, and distance learning? What, what do people need to do if my students want to follow in your footsteps? What are some key things that they can do to also make a difference and, you know, make an impact within those areas, Sal? So. Great question, uh, uh, Kurt. But, but first, first of all, thank you very much for this invitation and your brilliant introduction. I, I wasn't uh, quick enough and clever enough to follow through. I should have picked that up that you were pulling around and 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 um, should have caught on to say this is available on um, you know it's been around on um, Amazon and um, and wherever in, uh, in in Facebook or something like that but I I failed on that front Curtis <laughs> so uh, miserably I wasn't quick enough to follow your footsteps but um, great introduction and thank you very much for the invitation it's a privilege to be talking to all of you. Um, with regards to your question, really, I, I, I think that's a bait and I'm not going to bite that bait. You just have to be old, you know, after a period of time, you know, you, you, you get to be known. I've been around the circuit for a long time, you know, um, I, my first job, uh, is, is, is Kurt, um, uh, indicated I was born in, in, in the Pacific and so I ended up, um, after an education degree into the field of distance education, which was only starting at that time, 1980s. And a, a bit of luck here and there, a bit of chance and a bit of great people, you know, like Curtis himself, you know, uh, you, 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 you get to know. But um, look, I, I think we are in, in a great spot. You know, uh, the times are very ripe and rich uh for the 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 field of educational technology broadly but more specifically open and online learning one of the things that i i think that i think will 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 be a good tool to have in your armory is to be critical to be critical about the feds and 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 and, and the things that are being um thrown at us willy-nilly more so now than ever before. And last year, uh, was it last year? Yeah, I spent two months uh, after a keynote that I gave uh, at the Anadolu University in Turkey uh, in residence at the Anadolu University, where we mooted this idea of uh, a special issue of, 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 of the distance education journal on, on the idea of open. Uh, partly also because last year was the uh, 50th anniversary of the Open and Distance Learning Association of of Australia. Now, if if you if you want to be uh, uh, as Kurt was saying um, uh, on top of the game here, then I think it'll be good to engage with associations like the Open and Distance Learning Association, the USDLA in the U in, in the in the United States, and of course, uh, in in Canada, there's there's a bunch of organization. There was an organization called the Canadian Association of Distance Education, which I think is is dying or dead, you know. But there are other associations in Canada, and the European Association of Distance Learning as well. And then there's many others in the in the in the Southeast Asian region as well, in India and and um, Asia, the Asian Association of 
open open universities. This is a bunch of associations I think you need to keep a tab on because uh, that's where the professionals uh, engage and, and that's where the journals are located and that's where the intellectual input is, is, is generated. So that's another answer to your question, Kurt. Keep on top of, this, of these associations and organizations, be engaged with them, not necessarily as a member, but um, as a watcher, and then you will see what, what is going on and who is who. But over time, you know, people will get to know you and feel free to write, of course. You know, it's, it's, it's only when you put out your thoughts, people get to cite you, people get to um, uh, refer to you, and then your, your name props up. Otherwise, if you just uh, be receptive and don't contribute anything, you're not likely to be get, you're not like to be known. So going back to this idea of, uh, the, the the special issue last year. So while I was interested in it at Atlou University, I, I worked with a bunch of people and that's the genesis of that last article that Kurt was talking about. And I put my name last on it, even though it was my idea, because I, as an editor of the journal, I didn't want to put my name first, but be more the driver of the initiative rather than the, 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 the lead lead author. So all those guys uh, are from Anadolu University, as well as myself, uh, at the end of it. And that idea, that 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 article is sort of the, the, the pivotal uh, uh, article in that special issue. And the, 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 the impetus for that goes back, as I say, to the occasion of the 50th anniversary of the Open and Distant Learning Association of Australia. And we thought that we need to do something. So what 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 were we going to do? You know, um, we thought, and and actually I thought that it was it, it was important to visit and revisit the idea of open. The idea of open has been through a transition, and this is something that I want to dwell on with you. And um, I thought it was time to take a critical look at the idea of open, what is the idea of open? And, and uh, you know, just, just philosophically spend some time on that idea as opposed, as opposed to being you know, swayed by, uh, you know, uh, hype and, and hyperbole. Uh, and um, thought it, no better place than taking a, an academic and scholarly look at the idea. And so in that, in that, and so of course we went through the process of calling for expressions of interest and, and then and, and then producing the special issue. But I wanted, as Kurt was saying, not leave it to somebody else, but to drive it myself, having you know had the expertise and the experience in in the field. So I was probably not not there wouldn't be many people who'd be better placed to do that than myself. So I let me do it myself. And uh, and I knew the people around the place, having been in the field for a very long time. And having been associated with the Open and Distant Learning Association of Australia for about, you know, 56, well, well, pretty much all of its life, you know, so 40, 50 years. Um, um, but but going back to the, so, so I thought, you know, let's, let's get some people to reflect on the idea of open as well as, you know, ourselves reflecting on the idea of open. And, and I, I would suggest that you start with the editorial, because in the editorial, what I did is I tried to um, pull out the threads of it and, and going back to this, where did the idea of open come from? So if you go back to the, you know, 50s and the, oh, of course, you know, none of you are that old, you know, but, but you know, well, none of us are, uh, is that old. So, but around the 50s and 60s, you know, there was... Uh, this belief that education needs to be uh, in different form to be able to access people in difficult situations. But most importantly, in 1969, at the time there was a Labour government in 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 the in the United Kingdom, and uh, Harold Wilson, I think, was the prime minister. And, and the, 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 in in order to um, to 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 address the the uh, a labor government agenda, uh, they proposed that higher education, especially 
needed to be uh, released from the shackles, as if it were, from of, of, of the conventional educational practices of Oxford, Cambridge, and the British education system that you, you had to have privileged power, money, uh, to be able to attend campus-based operations. So how do you get education to the masses? the people who are working on the farms, the people who are working in industries, the people who are in the service industry. And Jenny Lee, who was the uh, minister or the, or the secretary of education in, um, in the United Kingdom at that time, came up with this idea of uh, the, 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 uh, the university of the air, so to speak, you know, that, that using at that time, the British Broadcasting Service, the television, to, to provide education, to offer education to anybody who wanted, regardless of their academic qualifications, regardless of their ability to pay, and regardless of the privilege or power that was required to attend campus-based operations. So the, the Open University was born in 1969 as a result of, of that, that effort or that initiative uh, but that is not the first open university. Open universities existed in other places. For example, the University of South Africa existed uh, long before the Open University of the United Kingdom. And in Russia, the open university systems uh, existed long before the UKOU. So there were open university systems. In, in South Africa, for example, it, it was the government initiative to be able to provide education to the black people, the colored people, because the colored people during the apartheid regime could not attend uh, campus-based operations of Pretoria which, and those kinds of universities. So the government uh, established the University of South Africa so that you know, blacks could attend, um, uh, could access higher education. So you know, uh, these kinds of operations existed before as, as a political imperative, socioeconomic imperative. But I think the UKOU takes the takes the takes the cake in terms of providing leadership on on the idea of opening up access. So so access was the big driving force when the idea of open came about. You know, it was about making education available regardless of qualifications, wealth, privilege, and those sorts of things. Um, so for for the for the sixties, seventies, and eighties, it was all about openness openness and access was 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 the driving agenda and and there are two parts to the question one was of course open access right being able to just access education so that whatever technology and this is where technology comes into the mix because if you want to take education out to somewhere else apart from the campus then you have to have some delivery mechanism right you have to transport something so obviously the print was was the most available mechanism. So think of print as the technology. But of course, you know, it, it, there was television, there was radio, uh, there was satellite as well. And we were experimenting with satellite communications in the, in the 1980s in the Pacific as a result of a favor from uh, NASA who made available, which made available a satellite for communications in the Pacific because of the lack of or good communications in the Pacific. So, so there was radio, there was satellite. I mean, you know, if if you look at communications, you know, Wilbur Schwam and those kinds of people come into mind. Communication was a large part of the equation. How do you communicate with people who are not in situ at one point? So, access was one of the biggest driving force of the idea of opening up education. But the the going along with access with this idea of flexibility. So so this is where openness and flexibility come together. So flexibility meant what? Flexibility meant in terms of being able to uh, study at any time. So you could study in the middle of the night if you're working full time all day. You could do your assignments on the weekends, and most of the time it was weekends, you know, uh, for people who were working part time or full time. So openness and flexibility were going together, you know, um, uh, as 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 the driving principles behind the idea of open for much of the latter part of of the twentieth century, eighties and nineties, and, and so on. So you know. Um, 
but there were challenges, obviously, you know, so people were saying, listen, now, you, you can't completely study all by yourself. And you know, if you were forced to, you did, like people living in Australia, for example, in deep into the interior on farms, on, on remote locations. So there's no opportunity to connect. But there, there came a time when people say, listen, you know, I mean, we can do much of this study on our own through very carefully designed instructional material. And this is where the role of instructional design comes in. But there were times when we needed to meet face to face. So institutions started to introduce summer schools or residential schools or weekend schools. So, you know, people would gather in study centers over the weekends or, or, or um, holidays or evenings at times, you know to do the bits of learning and teaching that were not so easy to do uh, remotely. So mechanical stuff, medical stuff, chemistry stuff, you know, biology stuff. Some of the things that required, you know, uh, labs or, or equipment, you know, for that you needed to gather at some place because that was the most economical way of doing it. So study centers began to be thrown into, into the mix. So this this is really the driving force of that very seminal article that Revel Rumble, who was uh, uh, at that time, you know, working, and this is in my editorial, wrote, um, who was working at that time at the Open University. He he tried to tease the difference between openness and distance. He said that listen, openness is a value, you know, it's an idea, you know, it's it's a continuum. How open can you be? Any institution is open up to a point and closed. And this is what Michael Glassman and those guys are talking about. And I found that article very fascinating because you might ask the question, how open is, for example, Indiana University right now, even though it might not pro profess to be an open learning system? So he, he, he twiddled and twiddled with this idea of, um, uh, you know, open learning systems and open learning systems. So, as as an uh, open as as a noun and open as an adjective, said so any institution can be open, but there's no such thing as an open learning system because no institution is an open learning system because it's it's a continuum. However, distance education is a system. Blended learning is a mode. So. He's separating the idea, the, the philosophical idea of openness from a method, which is distance education. To, so people could argue that blended learning, hybrid learning, high flex learning, or distance are methods, are manifestations of how open open can be. Now, this is a tricky idea, and, it's, it's, and this is our job as, as, as scholars to, to engage with this. And I, and I thought this was a very important thing to sort of uh, explore in this special issue. So in, in the latter part of the 20th century, a lot of it was about openness and flexibility, about access and about flexibility in terms of how you study, where you study, when you study. Come, come you know, David Wiley and these guys and the open access movement um, in the 21st century, I think mostly, uh, probably a bit later in the, in the 20th, the idea of open educational resources was promulgated. The idea of licensing, and David Wiley's uh, seminal work on the Creative Commons way of licensing resources, through a new, it, it, it threw a new, uh, it, it threw a, a, a new light on this idea of openness and flexibility that we were familiar with in the field. And David and his colleagues you know, brought this idea of open educational resource. Initially, it was all about open educational resources. And initially, as you know, it was a lot about a fight against publishers because David's main contention was that, you know, publishers are, you know, charging a lot for open educational resources and, uh, you know, intellectual property should be, should not be uh, kept under reps, you know, it should be differently licensed. And therefore he came up with these five C's or four C's at this time so that resources could be licensed differently so that people could allow the kind of access and flexibility that we were talking about in relation to open education. So this idea of open educational resource, which I have termed open scholarship, that bundle of uh, thoughts, you know, thinking around around how resources would be licensed and how 
material would be shared. I, I sort of, I'm beginning to use the term scholarship because I'm in, 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 in about 2016, I wrote an editorial about, about that, you know, and said, this is all about how it, intellectual property. I mean, traditionally in academia, we are very good at protecting resources, isn't it? We, we, we write something, we put our name on it, we put C on it and say, this is mine, you can't do it. And the music industry is like that. And we all know the, the, the politics around that and, and, and the, the legalities around that. Uh, but but there is there is a, a philosophical agenda. If you look at the United Nations Sustainable Goals Agenda, which is education for all, we want everybody in the world to be educated in the poorest and the poorest and the and the most difficult situations. So David's and the idea of this open scholarship movement is look, how can you achieve those things if we're going to keep these things under wraps, you know, and cover? You know, we need to think differently about <clears throat> how educational resources and the products of our intellectual property is shared you know, freely and openly, and also at no cost. Otherwise, the, the, the Western world always wins. In the developing world, the poorer countries always loses because most of the material that that, that, that is of, of, of value is produced in the Western world. And if the Western world keeps it under wraps and cover, then money is always being dragged from the developing world into the developed world by virtue of the fact that the, the, most of these things are, are, are produced and located in, in, in the developing world. So if you, if you are thinking about equity, uh, openness and inclusion, then educational resources have to be, or uh, products of intellectual property, let's call it whatever it might be, needs to be differently licensed and made available differently. And this is the whole genesis of thinking around open educational resources. But, but then a bit later in the 21st century, people started throwing words like open science. When I when I heard about it, what, what the hell is open science? Science is science, you know. But what these guys are talking about is is that si as opposed to I mean, there was a time people like Kurt and I will know that you know we uh, when we when we were writing articles, you know, or doing our research, we would protect data. We would say no, data is private and confidential. The data should not be made available in the public forum. What you see in a journal article is the report of the research that I did, but the individual names and and where we collected the data. It's like journalists do. We protect our source. You know, we say no, no, this is confidential. We are never going to share this. But think for a moment, you know, what is what is the point there? So people who started talking about open science said, no, 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 I want to know where you got the data because I want to go behind the scenes and look at the data. So journals are now beginning to buy into the idea and, and allowing authors to actually publish the data wherever it might be, not as part of the article, but with a link to some other place because so much of things are online. So that the original data that I collected can be placed in a server somewhere else and a link could be, and it could be made available with appropriate safeguards, of course, to people who wanted to duplicate that research or, or, or repeat that research or investigate or interrogate the data and perhaps do their own analysis. Now, one could argue that all of that should be possible. So this is the thinking behind this idea of open science. So you see, the idea of open that we were talking about earlier on in terms of access and flexibility got really extended, you know, with the with the with the with the encroachment of or the emergence or the the coming of the 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 the, the notions of open scholarship and open educational resources. But it's on the same continuum, isn't it? Because the idea of open access and open open learning were all about flexibility, openness, isn't it? We need to break out of the conventional models of learning and teaching and educational provision and open it up. Because if you if you if you if you have any faith in the United Nations agenda and the sustainable goals agenda of making education available to the poor, I mean, and people like Bill Gates and these guys go around where every child needs this. I mean, but as, as Bill was saying, you have to travel the world and see that it's almost impossible. There are people in, in developing parts of the world, and I, I would not name any, you know who they are and where they are. You know, forget about education. People have to survive. It's a matter of survival. Am I going to be alive next day is, 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 is the question. So if you're ever going to take education out to those people and to those places, 
then you have to think differently about education and institutions. If I were and I've been a senior manager at a university at, at a vice pro vice chancellor's level, and you educators, I mean, you, you think about how many institutions, how many institutions, educational institutions from primary school, from elementary school to higher education are thinking about their core business model. Nothing, you know, as you as we all now know, really hit the hit the, hit the sore spot and the and 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 the and the cold spot, you know, then 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 COVID-19, because no matter what I say right now, is irrelevant uh without factoring into well it, it, not not irrelevant but unbelievable without without factoring into the equation covid-19 because covid-19 actually showed us that if you don't think differently about educational provision then look what happened you you're going to be hamstrung you know no matter what your capacity was you you were stuck you couldn't do a damn thing about it right and 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 none of what we had. So if you're a vice president, if you're a president, or if you're a provost, you need to think about your, your business models. And 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 universities are very, very high. And this is what what Michael. I mean, um, you know, um, those guys from Scotland are talking about the openness and closure. They're saying that institutions are still very closed because our architecture, our our the way we organize the educational pro, pro, pro is is closed now if you just uh, compare this with how the business sector is operating how the banks are operating 10 20 years ago i mean uh, we couldn't do banking without going to a bank but these days you and i never go to a bank i i never go to a bank i hardly go to a bank all my banking is online i can move money from wherever i am i can pay bills whenever i want i can buy my groceries and have it delivered i can buy a cup of coffee and get it delivered but education is still very much constrained by the shackles, you know, that that you know the, the the guys from Scotland are talking about this idea of openness and closure. We are still very closed, and we have got mechanisms in place. And in academics, you know, and, and I think to some extent the medical profession, we are very we are very constrained about letting. Uh, power out of our hands. Medical doctors and professors are very similar. We we want to keep things under control. You have to come to me if you want to learn something. I'm not going to release everything. I'm, uh, you know, medical doctors and medical profession is very clear. You want to come and see me. You have to make an appointment. And come and see me, and I'm going to charge you a fee before I will release your results or something like that. You know. Um, so I I think there are some similarities, but I think the way we operate is 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 you know. Still under a lot of pressure to change. So this is how education or the ideas of openness and closure uh, is, is, is constraining the, the 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 fundamental principles of open, flexible learning and and the and, and engagement with all all countries. So over the over the fifty or sixty years, we went from thinking about openness as as open access and open uh, and flexible learning. To, to engagement with the idea of open scholarship, which meant that we needed to think differently about educational resources, making educational resources openly and freely available to people that needed it. And and, and another thing is, is, is no better example than Kurt, Kurt's article in, in the issue about MOOCs. And I think MOOCs is a very good example of how we were able to liberate. I mean, the guys who invented the idea of MOOC would probably never thought about these things, you know, but they, they were just simply trying to make the D2100 or whatever it was, an ed tech class available to anybody who wanted it because they have access to the internet and the web. And they thought, oh, great, you know, let, let's have more people. But then we thought, hey, there is something here. How about we make it the, because of the affordances of the technology, let's make the the understanding of facts principles a collaborative idea a cooperative idea so that you know we 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 are generating knowledge as a community so you see no i don't think that people you know who who came up with the idea of mooc initially thought a lot about this but it sort of grew you know as, as people started thinking there's something here and now the article that curtin and his colleagues you know um, uh, wrote in the special issue is, is a good example of, of the power of this technology of not only making education accessible to the remotest parts of the world, but giving giving these people so much so much power in their hands and all as a result of 
some divergent thinking about how learning and teaching can take place and the power of the technology. The, the, none of this was possible if, if, if the internet and the web were not available. And I think Tim Berners-Lee was probably the smartest guy at the time who, who, who had this foresight to make this technology available freely so that it was self-generating and it grew into what it is right now as opposed to keeping it under reps and cover. So this is another example of this idea of open scholarship and putting power in the hands of the people. Some of the kids that, you know, Kurt is talking about, you know, uh, took like about, you know, 60 or 70 MOOCs from Ivy League institutions, you know. I or mean, more than 100. Just, 100. More even than 100. Just, okay. Even if they, even if these kids, you know, learn ten percent of what there was possible, they're still learning. I and mean, what were the chances of this kid in Nepali, um, you know, home, you know, sitting and accessing education, let alone any university but from Yale and Harvard and those kinds of places? You know, I mean, I mean, okay, you might say, well, going to Harvard would have been twenty times better, but not anybody not everybody will be able to get this so you see you see this this idea of openness and flexibility which 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 brings me to one final final point and i want i want to hear more from you than for myself is that when you think about this idea of openness and flexibility and open scholarship it's it's not about a mode of education it's about freedom you know and and uh, amartya sen who is is a, is a nobel Prize winning economist um, explored this idea when he when he talked about development as freedom. He said that development is not about just giving you know food and shelter to people, but it's about giving people freedom. You know, and what gives people freedom is education. You know, you can give people money, and we've heard of the, this fish analogy. You know, give people a fish, uh, okay, teach them how to fish, and all that sort of thing. Education is a bit like that. If you give people education, then they can make their own decisions, make their own choices. You know, about what they want to do about their lives and the lives of their families. And this is the final paragraph that I, I left you with in my editorial: that education is a great leveler. Education is the thing that is now making me. Uh, competitive with you, no matter where I'm born, whether I was born, or I've been born, whether I was born in India or India, if I have the tools to communicate with you, then I compete, then I can compete with you, you know, uh, uh, on an equitable bay, on an equal footing, you know. So I, I think that, you know, as, 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 a, as, a, as, a, as a teacher, as as a as a program uh, as the head of a program as the head as the head of an institution as leaders in government or or wherever we are, we need to think about how we can make op education open and free and therefore, open flexible and distance learning or open scholarship is not the domain of one institution or the other. It's not something that is only unique to. Commonwealth of Learning or the Open University of United Kingdom or University of South Africa. It's everybody's business. Now, now you can see that even Yale, MIT, Stanford, they are opening up. You know, they, mind you, I mean, and this is my gripe with them. If they would like to test and try these things out on the side, Coursera, Allah, you know, and, and those sorts of things and 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 edX, you know, they like to test it out, but they don't want to change the core business model. The core business model is still tied down to the to the tutorial lecture and and campus based operation, and that's where I think we need to put the pressure for 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 presidents and and program developers to to think about openness and flexibility, not because it's a good idea, not because the technology is available, because it's it's a fundamental development principle. Because without openness, flexibility, and open scholarship, we can never make the world a free place. You know, we will, we will, we will all be constrained by and and handicapped by 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 the haves and the have nots. You know, um, and that's the, that's my final thought. I know I've sort of been rambling on, Curtis, but uh, I was well, on a roll there. You know, you were on a roll, so I didn't want to stop you. And that was the best short 30 minute answer I've ever seen as you've given us the history of the field. Now they're enticed in to read some of these articles. And so I, I will point back to the articles here for a second, read his opening editorial, read the one from Samnadu, read the first article from Terry Evans, 50 years of open ed policy in Australia. will give you some of the history in this. 
Then he's recommending my article on Nepal. I'm biased. Go ahead and read my article on Nepal. There, you know, I'm happy to send you more if you want to read them. Uh, and then I think the systematic review of the research that Karina Basu did might be an easier piece for people to digest uh, along the way in reading these. But then after that, uh, Sam's article with Araz and others, Openness in, Higher Educa in Education, a Living Idea, a Longitudinal Investigation of Its Growth and Development. And then might as well read the last article, the ending article, The Open Master, the, the Model of Transnational Education. So those are some I'm picking out here and put, putting a spin on or a stamp on. And do take a look at those. I was going to ask Sam, my first question was to me, okay, you're this flexible learning guy. Well, what is flexible learning? Then I was going to say, okay, you're this open learning. What is open learning? Okay. But you've answered those already for us. So I don't need to ask that, but you're also, uh, besides flexible and open, you're known in the area of distance learning, which you have, you've worked around, you've talked around what distance education or distance learning is. So maybe you can differentiate what is the difference between distance learning and online learning and is there one so that's the first place i want to go but before we do that I just want to say there was something else that you implied but you didn't explicate on and that are the sheer masses of numbers in open universities because the open university in malaysia started with nobody back in 2000 and grew by 10,000 people a year for 10 years and when my friend Aptar Kuar, who was a visiting scholar at IU in 1999-2000, went back to Malaysia, she helped create the Open U of Malaysia, and there are over 100,000 people. My other friend Tian Bilawadi was the pro vice chancellor, the rec director of uh, Open U of Terbuka, which is Indonesia, 800,000 people. And then I visited the Open U of China. We're talking millions of people. And then Dira Gandhi National Open U, IGNU is even more. It has 100,000 in every cohort of their MBA program. So there's some astronomical numbers that um, we tend not to hear about. Now, of course, those aren't all graduates. Those are people who entered in, but in one class, in one MOOC, or in one class at Dira Gandhi Open, National Open U, one could teach more students than they ever taught in their entire career over the 40 years, you know? Uh, so the impact that one can have in some of these venues is tremendous, which is a big load of, uh, I guess, placed on those instructors to do a good job and to, you know, the highest quality possible. So there's, you know, the learning wheels spin in everybody's heads. But um, there's uh, two other, you mentioned open ed resources. You didn't mention open courseware, but you referred to it, you know, MIT putting their courses online, it's called open courseware and Yale and Stanford. But two other words that are coming out now, so there's open courseware, open universities, open science, but there's also open educational services and open education pedagogy. So there's, so there's that too. So you wanna define open ed pedagogy and open ed services for us. You want to clarify the difference between distance learning and online learning? And do you want to tell us something about what you know about the numbers involved here? Just get people excited, what you've seen in the data uh, in this area of openness. So those are three different questions and three different issues. I know we want to get to student questions, but I, we, we really need to dive in here a little bit more before we do that, Sam. So what yeah, would okay. you like to okay. talk about first? Thanks, Curtis. There's a bunch of things. Let me maybe let me start with the numbers thing first. So the, the numbers thing was is is very closely to the tidy of open access. If you go back to my story about Jenny Lee and the Labour government in the UK, there was no way you could give the the the, the working class the educational opportunities with with Oxford and Cambridge and, and those sorts of campus-based operations because the physical infrastructure would not be able to just provide those services. There was no way people from the different parts of the UK would be able to pick up their bags and go to Cambridge or be accepted by Oxford and Cambridge and similar sorts of institutions and get the education that needed. So an alternative model, a different model had to come up, a model that was not based on a location, a physical location, physical campus and a teacher. The model had to do with taking education where these people were, so nobody needed to move. So as a result of that, you could have bigger numbers. You could have 
economies of scale. So many more people could register because all you needed to do was have one building, for example, in, in the UK, Milton Keynes, if you ever went to Milton Keynes in Bourbon, will tell you, it's, it's, a, it's a town, it's a small town outside, outside London, you know, about an hour and a half, and there's only one building. But yeah. yet it has- I drove around that pounds. building once. It's kind of, you know, it's blah, 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 you know, but they're servicing tens of yeah. hundreds of thousands of people. Yeah. Hundreds of thousands of students because, you know, nobody was going to come there. You know, the, if, if, if there was any need for anybody to go anywhere, they would go to a study center. So a study center would be somewhere in London, somebody in, 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 in Cambridge or some, somewhere in, in Birmingham or Liverpool or where. So we people could meet there and a tutor could be. So it's a distributed learning system. So the people who are actually the teachers were tutors, like your TA, like Bill, right? But instead, in, in Bill, Bill being here with you, the tutor would be somewhere in Liverpool where he would be, you know, she would be convening the group and helping the group and providing the feedback. So, so the model was one of develop the package and in those days, it had to be printed materials mostly with some audio implement, ship it out, mail it out, and students could study anytime, anywhere. And the tutors in those specific locations or the teaching assistants, if you might want to call them, would provide the local tutorial feedback and marking and send the result. So the physical infrastructure wasn't required and not important. As a result of that, Curtis, you could have large numbers of people, couldn't you? Isn't it? Because nothing was constraining you on taking the numbers of people. That's why these universities had very, very large numbers of people. The Indra Gandhi National Open University was able to get more than a million, two or three million students, you know, and University of South Africa. All these universities, UKOU is, I think, the biggest by numbers in the in the UKOU. And, 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 and of course, you know, uh, Tabuka University that Curtis mentioned, and, you know, you know, the population of these countries are so large that no campus-based operation can can and Kevin address these numbers? So open universities were the the mechanism to enable larger numbers of people. Now, then, then, then you might say, well, what about the quality? So yeah, okay, the quality might have suffered a little bit. But as as you say, um, you know, somebody said to me many years ago, if something is worth doing, then it's worth doing poorly. Now, there's something to be said about that. Okay, the quality of some of this and uh, learning and teaching in some of these courses might not be as good as, you know, uh, that, that was provided on the campus, but it was an opportunity, you know, and, and even if, if you got 50 or 60% of it, you know, you were still better off than when you were not. And this, this again, um, Curtis didn't ask me this question, but, but this is where people started to compare one with the other. So it said, oh, yeah, distance education is okay, but it's not as good as, you know, it doesn't allow me to have that conversation, that interaction, that community feeling, that sense of, you know, campus-based partnership and all those sorts of things. So for a long time, distance education suffered, and for the right reasons, as you say, because, you know, many times the quality of learning and teaching could not be as tightly controlled as it could be in a, in a campus-based operation like we're right now. Uh, of course. So so there was this issue, this idea of parity of esteem that Fred Jevons, you know, one of the um, vice chancellors from the UK who came and took over Deakin University in Australia came up with this idea. How do we get the esteem of distance education operations on, a, on par with campus-based operations? So you had to make sure that the quality of learning and teaching experience was on an equal footing. So that means you had to provide perhaps, you know, a bit more face-to-face -face interaction where it was necessary, especially in, in things that was necessary and provide more communication for interaction. Whereas traditionally, you know, people would say, do the material, prepare the material, ship it out. And it was independent study. Now, again, there's, there's a lot of to talk about here, Curtis, because there's a difference between independent study and distance education, right? So let me get into definition. Now, independent study could be could be anything. I mean, you could be studying, you know, beekeeping or, or sheep farming or something like that, doing by yourself and looking at the resources. So that's, that's independent study. That's very personal study. Many people now call it informal study or self-study. You can study anything you want anywhere. But that's not what we are talking about. We are talking about institutionalized formal learning system. 
and an earliest form of that was correspondence education right in the 50s and 60s which is basically writing this material having a using a textbook if not you know sending this material mostly printed out and you studied by correspondence so the only way you could communicate with your tutor or your examiner was by sending in assignments written assignments or letters you know and in those days this terry evans article and victor jacobet article people begin to think about well what is what is at the heart of this interaction? And Boya Holmberg, who's a Swedish educator, came up with this idea of conversation theory, the, 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 the art of conversation, guided didactic conversation was the term he used. It's like when a student and a teacher is communicating by, by, by letters or by, by writing, then they are in, in, a, in a guided didactic concept. The, the guide is the tutor. You are you are engaging in, in, in didactics, much like you know, you know, the traditional scholars used to do, the, the sophists and the Socrates people used to do communicating and talking, where not in oral form, but in written form. So you see, none of this is very new. We we had these sort of systems in, in our in our armory, but we were now bringing this idea of conversation theory and conversation and communication into the formal education arena. So correspondence education was fundamentally the, the first form or initial form of communication between the student and the teacher. Then there came a time in the 1980s when more technology became available, multimedia technology and television, radio. People thought that, well, it was not really just about the written form of communication. We were using other forms of communication. So in 1982, at, at a conference of the International Council of Distance Education in, in Vancouver, the community decided that we needed another term. And by that time, distance education was becoming more of a term that actually described the operation better than correspondence education. So International Council of Correspondence Education became International Council of Distance Education around the 1980s. So distance education became the, the, the more appropriate term for this model of learning and teaching, all right? And, and, and so that stayed for a long time. And as you saw in my editorial, you know, where Rebel Rumble is talking about distance education is a mode and now now much later when we had the web and when when we had the when we had the internet you know people started talking about blended learning okay we see distance education is good but distance education has problems as well because it's too much separation a lot of people cannot handle the separation so idea of blended learning came in and said all right we can do a lot of these things online because we now have the internet and the web but we can do some of this face to face. So that was the idea of blending, all right? Now, then more recently, we're talking about high flex. Well, flex, high flex, as I understand, is more about same course, but offering in different modes. So you have a blended mode as well as um, people taking face to face, uh, the same course face to face and, and people taking, the other people taking course in flexible mode. So I think that's what high flex is concerned. Blended is blending, online learning with some face-to-face -face, uh, interaction. Now, distance education is a precursor of that one, uh, of that. Of that one. So, so online learning is basically technology-driven. It you, 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 you have, to, so online, in, in many ways you could say online is a form of distance education because distance is an idea. It's, 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 not, it, it's not a physical thing as opposed to online is. Online means you have to be online, whichever technology you use. But distance does not necessarily require you to be online. You can have other forms of technology driving distance education. So in many ways, well, not in many ways, my, my position here, let me very, be very clear, we had correspondence education was print-based, it was limiting, so we moved on to distance education, which looked at the operation, tried to describe the operation as best it could. But now we have online because of the access to the internet and, and, and web. So many places, online education is a form of distance education. So I would say distance education is a more broader term than online education. Online education is a form of distance education. And open, of course, as, as Greville Rumble says, 
is not a system. It's an idea. It's how open you can be. Open is the is a is is a is a open and flexible is a philosophical pro proposition. It's not a. It's different from online, distant, and blended learning. These are modes. These are methods. You know, if you want to use that word, I prefer the word mode rather than method because method has other connotations. And this would perhaps you know take me to the. The other question that Curtis was asking about is, is open pedagogy and what, what is open pedagogy? In my mind, open pedagogy is like a bit like open science. It's like making my pedagogy open to, to you so that you can interrogate it and you can use it, adapt it, modify it the way you want to. I mean, that's that I understand. You might have a different view. It's like open science so that, you know, my scientific effort is 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 open to you, is freely accessible to you and, and shareable so that you can use it and, and modify it and adapt it to, 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 to your needs. Yep. As I say, just one final point, Curtis, as I said in my in my in my initial comments, I think I think there's there's a danger that we are we are taking a lot of these terms too seriously when they go when they get thrown at us. Let's be very critical about these things and not not just buy into everything that people throw at us. Anyway, Ted, thanks. Well, the other word I threw out there was open education services. Do you have any comments on what that might be? Your friend Sharonica had that in her book um, that we both contributed to. Yeah. Um, in the Sri Lanka, uh, what what are open educations open open ed services? I I'm I'm not really sure on that one. I mean, I, I am very clear about open educational resources, but open education services perhaps refers to the 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 services that are uh, provided as a result of uh, open ed, open open education. So in order to in order to engage in open education, you have to provide services. What are those services? Registration, right? Uh, recruitment, right? Those are those are services that that the institutions have to provide. Maybe you might want maybe to legal ask things. Come. Maybe legal things. Too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe legal things. As I said, let's 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 question these terminologies. Let let's not just buy into these terminologies because somebody threw it at us. You know, let let's. Let's be critical about these things. Ask the hard questions. I mean, do we need terms like high flex? You know, do we need things? This is one of the reasons I, I have not changed the term of the journal distance education over all these years. Because, I mean, which term is the best term? Because if you if you start buying into all these terminologies, you know, where do you stop? You know, so um, at, at some point you've got to stay with a brand that is perhaps, you know, as inclusive as possible. And I, I would prefer to stay with terms open and flexible because mm -hmm. open and flexible are value proposition. The modes will come and go. Tomorrow you will have another technology and you might not talk about distance education anymore. You know, but yeah. the idea of open and flexible learning will stick with you. Yeah, I like the word freedom you used earlier, and that came out in my research too. The number one thing people want from open education is the freedom that it allows, and the growth opportunities, the human development opportunities, the motivational opportunities, and and the choice opportunities. Just letting people decide, autonomy, ownership, uh, self-directed yeah. learning, all these things come out. Uh, I also want to point out you know, China, Indonesia, India, are the big ones, but there was also Pakistan, Nigeria, Korea, Turkey, and all four were also huge places um, and represented by some of the visiting scholars here in this virtual uh, setting. I also want to point out that um, correspondence was alive, yes, 50s, 60s, and 70s, but it continued into the 80s and 90s because I helped yeah. develop some of those things and take some of those things. So it wasn't, it didn't die uh, at 1979. It continued for a while and it still is alive and well during COVID in, in developing world. We're relying on correspondence and radio and television, all sorts of things to keep their schools afoot and the universities afoot during you know, 2020 and 21 and 22. It had a rebirth, if anything else, and it worked. For many people, it was the only way, you know. So uh, yeah. you know, many of these things have come; they've, they've come, they've subsided. They've not totally gone away. We're still utilizing them. Uh, MJ says there are telephone distance programs still happening with older adults, and for medicine in Canada, you know, remote telemedicine kinds of things going on. Uh, thanks, MJ, for reminding us. 
Um, let's ask Sam some questions. So type them in the chat window or just raise your hands and ask questions of him. Uh, you know, was there anyone who's, who's got a question, uh, you know, uh, that they want to jump in first? Uh, MJ, go ahead. You've got your hand raised. Yes. Hi. Thank you so much. Um, this It was just, uh, it's, I really appreciated um, the uh, sort of distinction between um, access and flexibility or those as sort of key tenants um, of of distance learning. Um, I wanted to ask uh, because um, for better or for worse, I have worked for one of the infamous OPMs in the past um, that have really made a lot of money um, or or maybe not so much these days, but have, you know, <laughs> uh, were able to, you know, their whole um, uh, business model was around creating online courses um, that, and making them accessible, you know, making them available, but then at, um, the, the rep, it was a revenue sharing model based on high tuition costs. So, um, I'm curious, like, you know, in thinking about, um, open education coming to, you know, name brand sort of universities who do, you know, hold so much around esteem and um and sort of there is this uh product that they're selling that is um it, that is that esteem how if you have any thoughts on what those kinds of like business models would look like in in terms of creating um and creating you know to them taking their uh distance learning into an, an open flexible free accessible way yeah, I have very strong views about that. I'm very critical and I've actually written a lot. A lot of my keynotes over the last four or five years since I've been a pro-vice chancellor, um, I, I've articulated because, I mean, there was a time when I mean, I'm fundamentally an educational technologist, a learning designer, then I sort of grew into senior management. And and when when I went into senior management, I, I, I realized that, you know, if if the president, vice president, and deans of the universities don't have their mindsets, you know, um, uh, uh, shifted, very little can happen. And, and and this is the point. And Curtis asked me to talk about uh, the article by Karina Busso, you know, and I think this is what Karina's, I mean, it's a literature review, but this is what what basically they're talking about. You know, they they are are saying, um, um, the the saying, for example, let me just uh, in that point uh, on on in in my editorial, I say that you know um uh, just uh, let me just read that line to you. The review suggests that in order to advance and scale out the course of open education, there is a need for broader consultation amongst key holders, key stakeholders, not just faculty members and students, because you and I are the converted. You know, we can bitch about it and brag about it as much as we like. But senior administration as well, because the practice of open education requires shifts in mindset, both academic and institutional choreography. See, I use that word very selectively because unless we we shift our operational models, and that's what we mean by choreographies, you know, um, and our mindset, very little is likely to change. And this is what those guys from Scotland are talking about, open closures and, uh, you know, uh, closed systems, you know. Shifts in institutional mindsets require a reimagination of the foundations and value propositions of education. Because without this kind of a shift, core operational models will be hard to change. I mean, you look at Stanford and, and, and MIT, I mean, and, and Harvard, MIT, you know, close to home. I mean, you know, um, um, those guys who, 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 who sort of, you know, um, it started this this operational model of open ed x and, and this is but if you go back i mean take a walk around campus systems in stanford you know how much has that thinking infiltrated into into their their core teaching you know the core research the university systems are still built around the professoriate and about grants and about research and less so teaching. Teaching is something that happens on the sides almost, in fact, you know, and people 
I uh, didn't think about it. I spent some time, I spent a sabbatical at Northwestern University, you know, which is an Ivy League university in Chicago, in Evanston, Illinois, as you, as you very well know. And I, you know, just, just out of the sake of it, I mean, many people will know Roger Schenck, you know, and I spent six months with Roger Schenck at the Institute of Learning Sciences. I mean, Roger Schenck was an Ivy League professor of computer science from Yale University, the best you could get. But I mean, I might add, poor Roger is dead now, but I mean, the, the research and scholarship in those universities was just as bad as, you know, uh, as, as it used to be at Cambridge and, 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 and Oxford, you know, this sort of, you know, boutique operations that was located around a professoriate, a, 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 around a person or a group of people. And teaching was something that happened on the sides and graduate students would hang around and sort of, you know, learn from one another and learn from being part of teams, you know. Teaching was never thought about seriously and in detail as it was when distance education came on the sides. Because once you try to break that operational model of the professoriate and the boutique nature of learning and teaching, you have to think about, well, what is teaching? What is learning? How I'm, I'm going to put that together? If I'm writing a set of study materials or textbook, uh, is that not teaching? Th that is teaching because I'm trying to explain a point to someone who is not there. And this is what guided didactic con conversation was about. It was not about writing a textbook. It was writing about it was about writing study materials. So study materials had to be different from from a textbook, but teachers were never told to do this. So, so see what, see, this is what the problem was. I was at instructional design in the 1980s. So the professoriate who wrote the materials wrote it like a textbook. So they basically reproduced the textbook to send it out to the students. Said, no, this is not what is required. We want you to write study material. We want you to write study guide, but then they don't know how to do that because they were never taught how to do that. So, we so this was the challenge. Shovelware, when online learning happened in 2000, my, your friend Ron Oliver in, in Australia and, and others called that shovelware. Tom Reeves and others. They, yeah, it was just shoveling up yeah, like face yeah. to face and put it on the web, you know, yeah, expecting yeah, the same this, thing to happen, right? So, yeah, well, this is right. You know, part of the reason for that is because we don't require professorial to be teachers. We never teach them teachers. We, I mean, this is a line that I've given MJ to other people. I said, we would never let an underqualified or non-qualified childcare worker close to our children. You couldn't be appointed a caretaker in, in a in a in a childcare center, you know, which is about teaching and taking care of people, isn't it? You know, but we would appoint professors to teach students without any teaching qualification. So this is what I mean, but unless that it changes. So more and more universities are now requiring teachers and professors to have teaching qualifications after their their, their science degrees or whatever right. degrees that they have, you know? Uh, but, but you know, it's still still far. I mean, you, you take account, do a bit of research and see how many how many professors at Stanford, MIT, Indiana, or, uh, you know, UCLA, wherever, have, have teaching qualifications. You, you'd be surprised. My hunch is there'll be less than 20% who have any teaching qualification. So Alicia has you a know? question for you. Um, MJ, was that a good satisfy? Okay, yep. Alicia. Thank you, Thank you, Dr. Bank. We are greatly honored to have you with us tonight, Dr. Naidu. And uh, uh, your academic achievements uh, are truly inspiring. I know that uh, you are the expert in um, opening education, distance education. So um, my question is, considering uh, your distinguished role as executive uh, editor of the Journal of educa uh, Distance Education, uh, would you please share with us some ideas or some advice on how to write uh, research articles uh, that are impactful and influential in the academic uh, community? Thank you. Oh my God. Um, thank you, Alicia, for that question. I probably, we need another another session on that one, Curtin, because I know Curtin, both I have talked about and given seminars on how to get published in, in, in the, but, but this is, this is, this is part of your graduate education. You see, I mean, I, I often time being, how do you, how do you become a researcher? My, my simple answer to that question is do, do a, do a research-based PhD. 
because when you do a research-based PhD, you get trained to be a researcher. That's why people do a PhD. Don't do a PhD if you don't want to be a researcher. This is why we do PhDs. A PhD is your training in research. So if you want to be a researcher and writer, find a good PhD program, find a good professor like Curtis Bong, and then go and train to be a researcher. And it takes time to be a good researcher. Everybody you know, who is on a research track is always learning. There is no point when somebody says, I am an excellent researcher, because there's always something to be learned. So when you undertake a, a training in research as a result of undertaking a research-based PhD, then you will learn how to articulate a research question, how to ask a research question, how to develop a methodology. I mean, I remember in my days when, when I was doing my PhD, uh, uh, there, there, were, there were some professors, I, I remember, I think there was some, a, a, a very famous name in one of the University of California, you know, um, he used to say that half of your PhD should, have, should be about comprised of methodology courses and half of it should be comprised of content related material. So if you're doing a, a PhD on instructional design, half of it must be about instructional design and half of it must be about methodology, like what kinds of research methodology, you know, qualitative, quantitative, statistical analysis, you know, these are your tools. If you are if you don't have the tools of your trade, which is the methodology, you cannot be a good researcher. So if you are in the middle of your PhD, make sure you know your statistics, you know your qualitative methods. If you don't, you will never be able to do good research. Thanks for your insights. So Alicia is a visiting scholar with a PhD from uh, Shanghai International Studies University, one of the top places. She's an English professor now and visiting scholar here along with Jill, Lena and Sanghi, as well as one other is, um, but she may have left. Uh, anyways, Amelia said, um, had a little comment there. I just uh, wonder if Amelia wants to jump in with a question. Uh, <clears throat> no, just, um, I'm just uh, thankful for your talk tonight. There's a lot of information that was shared that I'm just kind of mulling over at the moment. No question, but thank you for coming in tonight. She's coming from Japan, nearby, Sam. Um, who okay. wants to jump, okay. jump in next? Anyone want to? We're open for questions here. Yep, Bo, oh, of course. Yeah, I was, uh, while you were just talking about uh, the, the OER um, the, that we've already you know got out there, one of the things that, that was coming to my mind is uh, the hesitancy on uh, more uh, individuals, more institutions as well, um, uh, getting on board uh, with creating and allowing access to, to the resources that they develop. How much of this, um, you know, plays into a, uh, a financial uh, issue for some of these institutions? Uh, Dr. Bonk, you know, you would be um, one to probably admit that a lot of, you know, the concerns at IU, you know, they, they result um, from from financial obligations on, on behalf of the university and, and you as the the professor or the researcher as well. Um, you know, does, does that is that one of the things that's hindering um, the, the, the release of, of more of this material and more of, of these types of, of courses as well um, from uh, universities or um, educational institutions around the world? Very, very interesting, a very, very important question, Bo, you know, and, and this is really at the heart of the open scholarship movement because a, a part of it was driven by you know, uh, Curtis Bong, I'm sorry, no, Curtis Bong, Curtis Bong, oh, apologies, my bro. Um, um, Appreciate uh, David David, Wiley, you know, David Wiley and his colleagues, you know, coming up with this idea that um, the publishers are just taking, charging too much money. I mean, Taylor and Francis and, um, you know, uh, elsewhere, they've monopolized the market so much that, and, and nobody will tell you how much money that they're making, you know, practically Taylor and Francis have gobbled up, you know, even 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 you know some of the American publishers and they become so huge and they, they there was there was this belief that you know they 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 are taking so much money for for educational resources that were fundamentally produced by the community, and this mm -hmm. was the great 
the gripe is that you and I own the intellectual property. It's coming out of our, our, our knowledge. These guys take it and their argument will be, I'm editor of a journal. I go through this all the time. Their argument would be, wait a minute, what your intellectual property is not a finished product. You know, we have to edit it. We have to copy edit it. We have to typeset it and we have to publish it. We have to print it and we have to have the databases. I mean, this is how, you know, Amazon makes money or Google makes money. They say we have to have computers, you know, because where you, your content can be housed. So somebody's got to pay for that, right? So publishers are going to say, look, we are providing that service. I mean, you know, Kurt, Kurt is maybe that that's one of the answers to your open educational services question, you know, that we are providing that that service. And for their service, there has to be a price. Now, is that a fair price? So people like David Wyland said, no, 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 no. We, 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 we want that. If, if an intellectual property has been produced by public funds, you've been paid a salary, you wrote an article, you wrote a book, you wrote a study material during your working time, that is not yours. That belongs to the organization. That belongs to the community because your community is paying you a salary through the taxes, you know, so that whatever you write should be openly licensed. It cannot be licensed under a uh, strict copyright law, you know? Uh, so so th there was an argument, people say, if you're writing any book, if you're writing any article and you're being paid a salary, well, that you can put your name on it, that's fine, but you can't charge any money for it. That should be available freely and openly to the community. Because if you did not do that, then the haves and the have-nots will never be different. Then the people in the developing world will never be on an equal footing because they will never be able to afford what you produce. And, and because the dominance of the English language, you know, much of it is produced in the, in, in the English-speaking world, in the US and UK and UK, Canada, Australia and in New Zealand and in the and, and, and other parts of the world where English is being spoken. So, I mean, I'm, I'm, other, other uh, Germans and, and, and the French have their literature as well, but perhaps not as broadly as English. I mean, so, so uh, and how are you going to have that equity amongst different parts of the world if you are communities in the world if if cost is not a factor that you don't factor in, well, that's that, that, that's perfect. Uh, what about when it comes though to like um, to universities and institutions like that, um, where you know um, we'll just we'll use this course for example as R six seventy eight here on emerging learning technologies. Um, you know, obviously, Dr. Bonk, you know, uh, wants to to continue to to get paid. Um, uh, he probably appreciates his, his check every month. So, you know, what would be a, a solution to to making um, uh, you know a, a course such as this open and accessible to to anyone throughout the the world, while still allowing you know the those institutes? And maybe we're talking more about like some of the. Um, sorry, I'm getting some loud noise in the background. Um, maybe we were talking about some more of the, the uh, other universities that are out there that aren't quite as, as um, open to this idea as Indiana is. How would you get them on board and what would be the, the business model that would allow them to continue, um, you know, their research and their practices successfully while still, you know, uh, allowing any learner to, to access the, the content and the instruction that's being provided? Yeah. Oh, tough question, man. I mean, uh, I have some insights as a pro vice chancellor because th so this is where the rubber hits the road. You know, you you have to talk to senior managers and 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 the place to start is to look at strategic plans. You know, strategic plan because that that that's how you bring about change. When I was pro vice chancellor at one of the universities, I developed a policy. Every university, every institution will have a teaching learning policy. But if you look at the teaching learning policy, and this is a piece of research that one of us can do, look at te teaching learning policies of institutions, see how they are choreographed, how they are articulated. They're all based on things like assessment and content and and um, and, and, and uh, resources. Basically, that's it. You have a syllabus. I mean, if you look at uh, a lot of the syllabuses, you know, a lot of the syllabuses are based around their around content, you know, and um, what we need to do is we need to shift that model. And the only way you can shift that model is top down. Ground up is not gonna work. We can rave on and on about it. It's not gonna, you shift it from top down so you develop policies that will tell you how openness. So for example, the one that I developed, and again, I'm, 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 I'm my greatest critic. You can develop a policy, but the policy 
has to be socialized and it needs to work. So I developed a policy at one of my universities and said, uh, open educational resources should be mandatory. So every course at the university should foremost have open educational resources. If you cannot find a legitimate, uh, respectful, uh, respectable open educational resources, then you use a copyrighted course. So if if the if the dean says that all courses should begin with open educational resources, resources that are openly licensed, freely accessible at no cost. Now, you try and bring about that change. How are you going to bring that change when you're a faculty of, say, uh, 30 or uh, 40 professors? You know how professors are. They're islands on their own. They say, go stuff yourself. I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to use the resources that I want, you know. But if the dean says, no, your course is not going to run unless you have open educational resources as the leader or embedded in your resources. So develop the policy at the dean's level at the institutional level and and then and then socialize it and then and, and run workshops you know if i were a, dip, a provost or a deputy vice chancellor i'll bring all deans together our professors together and say listen guys it's it's not about it's not about who is right or wrong it's about the bigger principle it's about it's about equity it's about inclusion if you don't do this then you are you are not inclusive so what's the point of being talking about inclusive education and fairness if you don't adopt this simple strategy? I, I so really like the would, fact that you, you brought in the, the UN uh, Sustainable Development Goals to the conversation already tonight because I feel like more people need to, to be presented with those goals uh, you know, right up front and recognize that maybe the ultimate um, outcome for education should be not just a, a local or an individual shift in, in thoughts and understanding of the world around us, but something that is globalized and we're providing uh, access and affording individuals and, and especially regions that are you know, affected by this digital divide or educational mm -hmm. divide um, opportunities mm -hmm. to, to grow in the same way that we in the westernized world have, have been afforded here. Yeah, it's 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 it, it's it's a responsibility, isn't it? I mean, if you if you don't do that, then what's the point? You know? It's, yeah. Uh, what, what's the thank you very much? I appreciate it. Yeah. So yeah. we've got time for two more questions. I saw Esther has a question. I saw that uh, Anna has a comment. I'll just point out that in week one, we read from David Wiley an article I wrote with David about the waves of technology. So you may have seen that name. If you see my World is Open book, it was influenced by David Wiley. I asked him for advice when writing that book. Uh, I've done <laughs> symposia with David Wiley about open education. And he, David Wiley used to run the Open Ed Conference, actually, uh, and has been a leader in the field. In 1999, this class, this very class at 8 a.m. on August 28th, 1999, students in the, my room, in the room looked at my syllabus and they said to me, this isn't good enough of a syllabus. Where's where's learning objects? There's a guy named David Wiley who's come up with this idea of a learning objects. You're not, there's no learning objects in the syllabus. So I had to go revise the syllabus I'd been working on all summer because of David Wiley. I, the story is in that article. If you read my article in etr &D with David, I tell that story. But anyhow, I've been influenced by David. I think David's been influenced by me and by Sam, and we've all influenced each other. You know, this is the field. You know, he's a leader, yet he's learning a lot along the way. He was the ACT president last year. So if you went to ACT last year, he was the president, of, I think, um, the pre past president now, I think. Um, so yeah, he's very, very much involved in this field of of educational technology. Um, it looks like we need to go to Esther. Esther, your question. <laughs> Um, my question was about the digital divide. Um, in the history, I've heard about how um, the online or distance online learning has been, especially in South Africa during the apartheid and then Nigeria. And I, I've also seen um, some of the experiences in my own country in Uganda where people have wanted to do some online courses. Probably someone wants to study um uh, for a course in the UK or in the US, but um, many times they uh, they are not able because there's that digital device and then 
of course, access to technology, because depending on where you are, is very hard. And I wanted to know if um, online distance learning majorly aims for people that are able. And I feel that would be an inclusive, um, an equity problem. I don't know if there's anywhere they've handled that at all. Yeah, yeah, Esther. This is a this is a very a very critical question that that people are always going to ask, isn't it? Um, uh, so so how 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 do you how do you begin, isn't it? You know, um, um, technology is always going to be lagging mm -hmm. in in some part, right? So people are moving at different. So what you have in the U.S. will not be available in Uganda. What you have in Australia will not be available in in India or or in the Pacific. So that that will always be that will always be part of the equation, no matter how advanced this world gets. You know, this this world has been around for what thirteen billion years or, or something like that. You know, I I I love physics. You know, and I I'm I'm, I'm infatuated by how how we got here. Can you imagine what this this globe, this community, this society will be? Let alone thirteen billion, but even fifty years from now, you know, how much has changed in the last fifty years in our lifetimes? Can you imagine our children, our grandchildren, what they will have access to? What technologies will be available? Chat GP AI was not as big. Chat GP AI has been with us for fifty years, but look what Chat GP did. So in 50 years, you know, the world will be a different place, you know, and, um, you know, um, if you listen to people like Yuhal no, 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 uh, Hariri, you know, the, the Israeli um, author, you know, he, he, he talks a lot about the world where we came from and where we're going to be. So that kind of inequity, uh, Esther, is going to be around. So the question is what? And I see a lot of people say, oh, you know, online education is not good because one, we don't have the technology, or we have the technology, it doesn't work, or the internet is slow, right? Or, oh, no, wait a minute, we have the technology, but we don't have the skills. We don't have the independent learning skills. We don't have the support. So what are you going to do? Don't do it. Do you work with the slowest and the weakest link, or do you work with the with the fastest and, 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 and the most sophisticated link? In fact, you need to do both, you know? And, you know, the situation that you are faced with in Uganda and Nigeria, and I've traveled in the developing part of the, I'm from the Pacific, you know, myself, you know, but, but technology is changing. I mean, one of the things, for example, I mean, I'm not a great fan of Elon Musk, but, but Elon Musk is now, as a result of uh, his, his, his work, um, started to launch a, a series of Earth orbiting low, what they call LEOs, low Earth orbiting satellites. So these satellites are not as high up as the other satellite, but they are low Earth orbiting satellite. And and there's a there's a there's a there's a program called Starlink. Google Starlink. You know you'll find what Starlink is. So Starlink is a a a, a technology that is made available by this low Earth orbiting satellite that Elon Musk is now launching or has been launching for about since 19, 2015, 2016, that is specifically designed to give internet access to the developing and then rural parts of the world. Now, that's the specific objective of that. So that kind of initiative, it's not a philanthropic, uh, there, there's a charge for it, there's, there's, a, there's a cost of it, but physical, you know, cable-based systems may not no longer may no longer be the only means of communication that we have we have to move from terrestrial you know cable based communication system to satellite based systems that will enable that people in remote locations are pacific islands you know islands where people are still fishing spear fishing and and digging for food will have access to internet connectivity through these technologies. So I would rather put my eggs in the technology basket and say, let's push ahead because sooner or later, your people in Uganda will have that technology. They may not have it now, but, but are you going to hold yourself back? If you don't do it now, your grandchildren will not have that technology or have not the facility. So you got to start somewhere. So work with what you got now. 
because there's only one way the world is going. We're going to have better technologies, right? We're not going to get rid of it. We're not going to throw everything we have. We're going to make what we have better. That's, that's I think we are going to do it. Same wavelength. Song. Thank you Same so wavelength. much, Dr. Naidu. Very okay. informative. Is Definitely. Anna still here? Did you have a question, Anna? And that will be the last one, I think, for tonight. It's been longer than we planned. So if Anna's going to stay muted, I think Sung-hee has a question. Sung-hee, oh, go yes. ahead. Anna, it took too long. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, we'll get to you, Anna. We'll get to you. Sung-hee. Uh, yes, thank you. Yes, I'm Sung-hee from Korea. Thank you for your lecture today. Uh, I wonder if it is possible to open an open course to educate experts expert who needs practical training in workplace. For example, would it be possible to open um, teachers, nurse, doctor, or emergency technician like that? How's your uh, opinion? Yes, thank you. Um, I, I, the answer to that question is yes, of course. Yes. What's stopping you from doing that? I mean, look at what Curtis Bonk is doing right now. You know, Dr. Bonk is making his class available to anybody in the world, you know, because he has access to the technology, right? He, he could have just kept his class limited to his 12 students or 25 students who, who come and register in Indiana. But no, no, he's, he's doing exactly the opposite. You know, he's taking his class, which, which does not require any more effort. I mean, he's got a network of uh, colleagues and experts throughout the world. He's taking advantage of it. Now, what is stopping you from doing the same sort of thing, developing a course and, and utilizing the resources that are available in the world? This is the beauty of the technology that we have now, the internet and the web. You know, it's a, so the, the, it, you are limited by your imagination, not the technology. The technology is already available now and it will get better as you and Esther and I were talking about, you know? So, and will people will have access to? So if, if you know, you don't have to be the, the, the source of all information. If you can think a little bit more divergently, creatively, you can have the resources around you like Dr. Bonk is doing right now and letting other people do the work, whereas he is basically the guy who's engineering everything from behind the scenes, you know? And this is what this is what you know um, the guys. I mean, I forget the names of the guys who who developed the, the Amuk idea. You know, they did that in 2012. You know, when 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 they developed a course for graduate students, and they said, "Oh, well, wait a minute! You know, can we can we open this up now so that you know other people can join in?" So that the whole idea of Mooc was born as a result of that, isn't it? George Siemens and Stephen Downs. There you go. From... George Siemens and Stephen Downs. From Canada, from Athabasca University, yeah. George, and from uh, uh, the Canadian Research Council, where Stephen was in uh, New Brunswick. So, yeah, um, and they, yeah, they, they, they were teaching a course, right? Yeah, they were teaching and, a course, and they said, "Wait a minute, we can do better than this," you know. And, and, yeah. and I, I love what, what I love what Dr. Bonk is doing because look, instead of giving the lecture that I gave you. He did better than that. He got me to give that lecture, you know, and he's sitting back relaxed, you know. And David Wiley did the proto MOOC. David Wiley had an article on him in the Chronicle of Higher Education, said professor giving certificates to students who are not his. So what did they say? He was teaching a course, maybe the history of ed tech or something. And anybody shows up who completed these modules would get a certificate from David Wiley at Brigham. At that time, he was a professor at Brigham Young University, BYU, and he signed all these certificates and sent them all over the you know the world. And you know, and it, he didn't get permission from his president, but later he did. You know, he they they were, what's going on there? Well, I'm just you know letting anyone come to my classes that want to join, and I, and that was 2008. And uh, I was teaching this class in 2008 when the article in the Chronicle showed up, and I said. This is what I've been talking about in here, in this class. Uh, opening up education to anybody who wants to come in, any way, shape, or form, whatever they want. To get. And so I, I found the, the um, kind of like uh, the exemplar, you know, the, the proto-MOOC. And then George and Stephen, the following year, it wasn't 2012, it was 2009. 2012 is when Stanford jumped in. When they did, Sanford did three courses with 50,000 students each. And then it got in the New York Times. Everyone said, wow. And I got interviewed for the article in the New York Times. I don't know if Sam knows this. The most cited article on MOOCs 
was titled The Year of the MOOC. And it was in August in 2012 when I was interviewed for the article. I taught the first MOOC at IU in the following year. Uh, but anyway, I got interviewed for this article. I'm telling my mother, I'm being in the New York Times. For, for about four months, we're waiting for this article out. In the meantime, I sent the author of the article all my books. I signed them for her. I said, thank you very much. I, bust, I sent them on. I sent her, probably sent her some chocolates, whatever. And the night before the article was to come out, the lead editor of the New York Times cut my interview out. So I'm not in, <laughs> interviewed. in that most famous article, uh, the year of the MOOC, but instead, they interviewed the head of MIT, you know, open courseware and MOOCs and Stanford. Of course, I was not one of those guys. So, yeah, it was interesting, uh, but <laughs> it was funny. But anyways, there's a history to all this. And in this, yeah. this, in this class, some of the history started, really. We learned the history and each iteration of this class has tried to epitomize a different piece of the history. Uh, and and trying to you know utilize and so in in the forums in the discussion forums we're using ChatGPT for a human computer interaction or human you know augmented uh, technology interaction in one of the forums and one we have human to human one human to technology or AI so we're trying to utilize what exists within the time period you know so next week in this class we're going to get a bow and we're going to get my former student Bell Lee from Purdue. And we're going to get um, my former student, Merve Bastigan, now at Texas Tech, going to demonstrate some technologies for all of us at 6, 7.30, and 8 o'clock. And tomorrow at 11.30 in the morning, as I said, we're going to have a guest, Ramesh Sharma, come in from India to talk exactly what, what, what uh, and expand upon what Sam has said. So um, before we wrap up here, Anna, did you really have a question or were you just toying with our brains here a bit? I'm just curious. <laughs> well, it, it started out as a comment, but it is it has grown into a question. Uh, as, it's, as it's a, the as last a question for tonight goes to you. Yeah, and, and probably the, the, the worst question, the most difficult question, which is, um, uh, please, uh, is there a way to help me not be as, as cynical about the the business side of all of this. And, and what I mean by that is, um, you know, it's it's very interesting. I Well, I won't pick on our own institution. I'm, I'm an academic advisor here at IU, but there are other institutions as well that have come up with, you know, online degree programs. Um, and, you know, those are very, they become very highly touted because they're a great way to, you know, have people, you know, access these programs all throughout the world. But there is tuition attached to it. Um, meanwhile, you know, when we try to offer, uh, you know, courses in various, you know, high flex or online or anything in the traditional uh, residential college experience or, or you know, even services or that sort of stuff, um, you know, I, I feel like higher ed as, a, as an industry sort of discourages that and especially uh, you know, as we said, you know, like giving uh, or uh, offering open educational resources for free. Um, so it seems like, I guess, a lot of these, uh, you know, how we feel about distance learning and how we feel about open educational resources really has to do with where the resources or the potential for making um, revenue from it. Um, and so do you do you feel like that is one of the primary drivers of all of this or you know is there truly you know innovation and and wanting to share education is that is that also a primary driving force at this point again sorry simple to be so simple i don't know simple answer to your question is both anna you know because look um the way the world is structured you got to make money you got to live right and if there's an opportunity to make money you think i mean you know, um, MIT and Stanford when they when they started these ventures, you know, what they were they 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 gave you this bullshit about being altruistic and educating the world, but at the end of the day, they were interested in in leveraging the power of the technology. I mean, what was the name of the girl, who, the Coursera, the woman who started the Coursera? She goes on um, TED yeah. Talk and says, "Guess what? You know, the internet is here. Education can be." can be open and accessible to the world, but all of it was driven by financial motives. You know that, they're lying between their teeth. I can see you telling me about that. So listen, I have no problem with people making money, you know? 
but that's that's one box. That's one part of the box. You know, if you have an opportunity to make money from your educational resources, go for it. You know, that's fine. I have no problems with that whatsoever. But the other side of the equation is if you are on a paid job and you're being paid to do a job and and uh, and you, you are doing this work as part of your paid employment, then it, it, it does not make sense that, you know, you um, you you may want to charge some money to to retrieve your costs, you know, but but there's some altruism will have to kick in there and say, listen, I have a, as an educator, I might have a bigger role to play. So let me make the course that I'm teaching, just like George Siemens and, 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 and Stephen Down did, you know, make it available because they were not losing anything. They were not losing any benefit from it. And if they wanted to, they could have made money out of it. So I, I think that you know, we have to strike the balance between both, right? I mean, you, you can't tell me that if I have an opportunity to make money, then don't make money. No, that's silly, right? Everybody wants to make money. If I can make a bit of money on the side. I mean, I I do that right now. Sometimes when people ask me to give a, a talk and I say, well, you got to pay me for it, right? I'm not just going to give a talk all the time free, you know? So that, I, I think that's fair. I'm not going to charge $2 million. I'm going to say, give me $500. I'll, I'll spend some time preparing this and I'll give you a talk, right? Okay. So I think that's fair. But at the same time, if I if if I've got enough money to live and work, and and what I'm doing is no further um, you know, cost on my time and effort, I'm quite happy to share it and give it to you free, like like I'm doing for my friend right now. You know, I mean, no big deal. You know, so I I think you've got to strike the balance right, and and both are are legitimate. And yeah. Yes, that, that, that makes sense. Thank you. And it almost makes me think of um, almost like in the legal profession where, uh, you know, there's a certain level of pro bono things that that lawyers will do for the benefit of the community. Um, so, so, yeah, interesting idea. Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. So my tech variety book is free to download. I told people in the Philippines I was disappointed with what my publisher charged. They were charging three times U.S. prices. I said my next book will be free and therefore it is. You know, we did yeah. some video primers on how to teach online. I did 27 of them for IU. And I said to the dean's office, let's make them free to the world. If we're going to be free for all the faculty, what's, why not make them free to the world? They've been downloaded yeah. 100, 170,000 times. They were free to the world. The whole country in the UAE uses them, all military bases. And, you know, just it's amazing what can happen when they are free. I thought my free book's been downloaded uh, 250 some thousand times in Chinese or in English. And then the counter broke. I don't even know how many. After two years, that's that. The last eight or nine years, I didn't even know how many. Probably a million times. You know, but that's good. You should get that out there. I also have books where I get small, small royalty checks. They're not a lot, yeah. Um, yeah. but you know, so it's some of both. Each. I got someone from the Cree Nation. I've spoken to the Cree Nation in Canada a couple of times. She wants me to speak again. I. You know, I delay her always a little bit, but I try and do something for them, you know, when time allows, you know, you can't do everything that comes your way at every guest talk and every so thing. We have to thank Sam for doing this for us tonight. He's come for not just a half hour, not just an hour, but he's come for almost two hours tonight. So I think he definitely needs some notes in the chat saying thank you very much. And we need to give him a big round of applause here to Sam to do to help us with week 12, R678, uh, part one of the spring of 2024 and emerging learning technologies along with Bo. Bo, it's great to have you as my assistant back here again tonight. Uh, we missed you for a couple of weeks. Um, you know, and actually Sam's an honorary member of this class because two years ago when I taught this class, he came almost every week. And, 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 and so maybe next year he'll come again. I'm going to stop the recording here. Uh, and yes, it's going to the cloud. Let's wave to Sam before the recording stops. Uh, one more.